everyone, welcome back to the Captain Logan Show. Tis I, Captain Logan, and look as always, it's my wonderful chat moderator and producer, DJ Martinez. Hey guys. That's Greetings, me. DJ. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm excited how, for this. How it's you feeling fun. after your crazy weekend? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm back. I'm back I'm back to hundred percent, I think. Yeah, <laughs> your your voice sounds like a normal person voice now. So that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, tonight, we have a special guest co-host. It's Melinda Snodgrass, uh, one of my favorite people to talk to. Uh, I did an interview with Melinda a couple years ago uh, about Star Trek and her writing career. And uh, if you want to know more of the ins and outs of, uh, and we'll get to some things here and there, I'm sure, tonight uh, about Melinda's career, uh, you can go check out our original interview. Tonight's going to be a little bit less formal and more of a regular Q&A show uh, like we do here on the Captain Logan Show. Uh, we want to bring Melinda in for whatever we end up talking about tonight, which will be a whole lot of fun. Uh, but we also want to talk specifically about recent Trek things regarding Melinda. It's gone. It's gone. Get a little spicy. Uh, so Melinda is uh, the, the writer of one of the most beloved episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation, Measure of a Man, uh, which winds up uh, number one on a whole lot of uh, people's lists. Which is amazing because uh, she only worked on uh, really four or five scripts and was script editor through season three, and uh, then didn't write anymore after that. So it's amazing that a season two episode continues to top a lot of people's uh, lists, but uh, Melinda is also a uh, an, an author. She's working on a couple of different series right now at the moment. Uh, she's um, constantly working on uh, Wild Cards with George R.R. R. Martin, and uh, I'm, I'm going to let her plug some things, and we'll talk about all kinds of things this evening. Uh, but as always, uh, welcome, guys. Thanks a bunch for popping in live. If you're doing that, thanks for watching After the Fact, if you are doing that. And Melinda, welcome to the program. Thanks for spending an hour or two with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. We had a good time in Kansas City at that con, so I'm, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna have another. In fact, I think we got yelled at because we went over our allotted time, and you know people were going, "You're supposed to be doing this other thing," and I was like, "But we're having fun." So, oh, that was really good. But anyway, I guess I'm, I didn't even know that. Thanks so. for inviting me. Well, thanks for sticking around longer with that interview. Uh, it was really fun. It was super. I don't know. It was super relaxing, and I learned a lot. And uh, anyway, it was great. So. I'm glad that I'm glad you're back. It was really cool of you to do this. So, uh, as always, if you're watching live, folks, uh, you can if you want to make sure that a question or topic uh, gets talked about on the program, you can leave a super chat in any dollar amount, and that will guarantee that we talk about whatever you want us to chat about. But we'll also do as many pre-written questions as possible as well. Uh, our lead-in uh, topic, as aforementioned, uh, is gonna be Picard and its relationship with Melinda Snodgrass. So. Um, some some odd things happened with that show, um, and a lot of you guys know my feelings about that, and I won't get into that unless it gets relevant or anybody wants me to say anything about that show again. I'm kind of tired of talking about it, uh, and I'm kind of tired of thinking about it. Honestly, it was out of my brain for a while, and now i got to bring it back for a minute, which... Sort of sucks, but anyway, uh, so Bruce Maddox is uh, a character that was brought back for that show, uh, more as a plot device than a character, certainly, uh, but he's there for a minute, uh, spoiler alert, they kill him off as quick as they can, and uh, Melinda created that character for The Measure of a Man, and uh, her name is nowhere anywhere uh, in Picard, uh, nor, as I understand it, was she compensated in any way for using that character. Uh, so the, the first thing I want to ask you, Melinda, is what what exactly are the Writers Guild rules when it comes to characters that a writer uh, or, or ideas or what have you that a writer uh, comes up with for an episode and then when those things come back again? Because initially my understanding was that those things are, are wholesale owned by the studio. Is that is that not the case? Well, it, the rules had changed. So. Um... Prior to this, if a character that you created a character and they got used, then you got a character payment. It wasn't a lot of money. It was like five or six hundred dollars, you know. And uh, when I was working on another show called Reasonable Doubts with Mark Harmon and Marley Maitland, um, I had created an ongoing character, a love interest for Marley's character, and I kept getting these nice little checks, you know, creating it. And I thought that was still the case when Picard came up and and Bruce actually appeared, albeit briefly. But it turned out that somewhere in our negotiations over the years, they had changed that rule so that now the character you created has to have been used in a significant fashion, as in being the lead in a new spin-off show, or you don't get anything. So, you know, again, it wasn't like it was going to make 
change my life, you know, whether I got paid. I, I think what was more um, disturbing to me in, in a really fundamental way was that uh, I've never watched any Trek. I, I did half of season two and all of season three with Next Generation, and then I was burnt out, and I never watched any more Trek. And all of a sudden, I started getting you know messages on Twitter and on Facebook from my fans and friends going, did you know that Picard is based on Measure of a Man? And I went, no, oh, really, how interesting. Um, and, and so it felt a little odd that nobody ever, you know, from, from the studio or the writer's room ever said, hey, we're going to use this, you know, seminal uh, episode that you wrote and we're going to build Picard around this episode. And, um, you know, I would have liked to have known. Um, I would have liked to have been asked to be in the writer's room, truthfully. Uh, I think I, you know, would have enjoyed that and it would have been fun. There were some great characters in that in that uh, series and I would have liked to have written for it, but you know, water under the bridge and I, I don't totally understand what went on, but something went on. So that was, that was what happened. And you know, because I thought I was, you know, perhaps going to get a character payment, I did end up watching the, the Picard show just to, you know, see what they did um, yeah. with, with poor old Bruce. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, that was how that all happened. Uh, so w were you expecting and, and, and should you have expected uh, at least at least a credit, at least a mention of your name? Um, you know, I, I would have been nice. Yeah. Uh, I think that when they did, um, I believe when Wrath of Khan, uh, when the feature film was made based on uh, Space Seed, they actually credited the author of the episode from original Trek, yeah. Space Seed, he did get a credit. Um, he was mentioned um, on the feature film. And, you know, I think I think it would have been nice. Um, I mean, you know, in this era of Me Too and Time's Up, it does feel like women, oftentimes we end up getting erased off of our own creative endeavors. Um, and and uh, so I think it just, you know, it would have been courteous, <laughs> you know, yeah, to sure. have mentioned that, that Measure of a Man was the, the sort of, genesis of this of this idea um and uh you know they they made choices that i i found to be odd but you know i wasn't in the writer's room i wasn't on the show so i couldn't make my opinions known until well after the fact so after yeah. this thing had aired so I, melinda I, i'm so down on that show and on new trek anyway i would uh, i i'd love to think you could have made a difference i had i have my doubts that you in that room would have made any difference at all <laughs> you know, I, I, I only know very peripherally, uh, you know, truthfully, I'm working on my own projects. I have a TV pilot that I wrote and then COVID hit. So we didn't get, get to start shooting it in June as we had hoped. Um, and, and so I'm, you know, I, I try not to think about it too much. Oh, of course. I, I love yeah. being in writing, I love writing scripts and, uh, so, you know, I miss that, but thank God I have the novels and, you know, it's good to be home in New Mexico. I was in LA um, for quite some time because I was working on wild cards, trying to get that set up. And, you know, Hollywood is, is I love it and it makes you crazy all at the same time. Would you say at this point in your career, you kind of prefer writing books or is it sort of all things being equal? Is it sort of six of one and half, half a dozen of the other? If I could, all things being equal, I would rather be in a writer's room on a TV show. I love, love, love writing scripts. Um, I just, I find the the spareness and the elegance of script writing um, to be really, really exciting. I mean, you know, novels are great, except that there are certain things I hate writing in novels, like interior dialogue. <laughs> if I can at all make it an actual dialogue, I will do that and description. I hate writing description. Um, and I, that's, that's one of my worst flaws. I mean, my writer's group is always going, great dialogue. Are they in a white room? Could you possibly tell us where they are? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Can I just have the set designer do that? <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I do love writing scripts and I love the collaborative nature of it. I mean, if you have good actors, 
sometimes you don't even have to write that dialogue. You can let the actor do it for you with just a look. And that's a, that's an incredible feeling. And you know, we can't we can't get away with that in novels. But you know, I love to write, bottom line. I'm always going to write, you know. I'll probably be dying and still trying to go, wait, just I have this one story I want to finish telling, you know. I'm sure it can also be helpful and just really fun to write for an actor, right? Like a pre-established character that somebody uh, has in their performance helped to develop and then you've already got that foundation to work on. Oh yeah, and and uh, figuring out you know certain quirks of actors and things that work really well for them and things that don't. I mean, that's one of the reasons that it's really important for a writing staff to get to watch dailies. Um, because periodic you would go, ooh, never write a line like that again for this particular actor, you know, or, or that worked really well, you know, how can we, um, and so it, 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 it gives you a better sense of, because it is a team effort, I mean, it's an enormous team effort, um, it, but it's, it's, everybody's working for the same result, which is to hopefully make something wonderful that uh, entertains and maybe, you know, gives people a moment of inspiration or something to think about, um, and God knows this is the golden age of television right now. This is the best television has ever been. I mean, we, we have so many wonderful shows to watch. I was going to ask you this later. What is the best thing on right now, if you're Melinda Snodgrass? Oh. <laughs> which you are. Right on. <laughs> which I am, yeah. Because um, nobody would want to pretend to have that last name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's so okay. memorable. I remember being a kid seeing Measure of a Man, like, noticing your name, and I never noticed writer's name. I was like, what's a Snodgrass? <laughs> it means at the place of the well mowed grass. And actually, uh, when I can ask this one question, I'll go back because Roger Zelazny convinced my first writing agent to stop trying to make me change my name because he said nobody will ever forget her name. And if they yeah. like her books, they'll go find them. So I and, and my father would, you know, it would have killed him if I had done that. Um, what is the best thing on television right now? Well, uh, I'm a science fiction girl, so I'm going to say The Mandalorian. Yeah. Which I love. Um, I'm so excited just, you picked something I've it, seen. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's pretty much, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit behind on things, and um, I, I keep re-watching stuff I love, like Star, Star Wars Rebels. Are you getting the feeling I love Star Wars? Because I do. <laughs> yeah, I didn't um, know you were that big of a, of a Star Wars fan. I am a huge Star Wars fan. I haven't watched I mean, it you yet, but how did you feel about the end of Clone Wars? Um, oh, oh, I thought it was so, so bittersweet and moving. And um, yeah, I loved the, I loved Clone Wars too. I've watched, in fact, I own all the discs for Rebels and Clone Wars. And now I don't have to pull out the discs because I have Disney Plus. Um, yeah, I mean, I like the Marvel movies. I'm looking forward to the new Marvel shows, you know, um, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think if something has really... What did I watch recently that I quite liked? Um, oddly enough, Enola Holmes. I thought it was really cute and well done. Oh, I don't even know what um, that is. Oh, cool. I, I started that, but I haven't finished yet. I'm excited about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes' little sister, Enola. And she's a teenager, and it's 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 just sweet and fun. Um, and uh, the other thing that I watched was The Old Guard, which is a kind of a TV movie. Clearly, it's a backdoor pilot. Um, and with Charlie, I've been mispronounce her name, Charlize Theron. Um, I enjoyed that. I mean, there's just so many things to dip into. I mean, I'm way behind. I have to watch the second season of The Umbrella Academy. I haven't even watched um, the first yet. Oh, yeah. I've been threatening to finally review that with DJ for months. Melinda, we are mostly a superhero channel here. That's most of what we talk about. So I'm glad you brought up MCU and Umbrella Academy and some things because uh, my audience is going to want to pick your brain about some of that stuff, I'm sure. So uh, you guys keep the questions coming and feel free to ask Melinda about uh, about especially Marvel stuff and that kind of, that kind of thing because I didn't know if you'd watch any of that. So that's exciting. You'll have things to say about things we usually talk about here. Um, oh, listen, well, I, I uh, edit and co-created a superhero franchise with George Martin. Wild Cards is a superhero franchise. Yep. I mean, that's our books are about superheroes. So yeah. 
Well, and I was going to ask you if you were if you were even still you know keeping up with any of the superhero these days, or if that was mostly just uh, you know inspired by stuff that you that, that you looked at when you were younger. Uh, so you've answered that now. But let me ask you this: uh, When you were growing up, who was your who was your superhero? Like who is your who is your your guy or your gal? I didn't get to have a superhero. My father would not allow me to read comic books. Wow! I had to read real. I could not read anything with pictures. And so my only options were I there we would go and visit friends who had a cabin uh, on a lake and their grandson had this huge stack of comics. And so when my parents were off doing other things or playing cards with their host, I would go in and frantically read the comic books, you know, because that was my only opportunity. Um, and I think this is going to sound weird. Um, as some of you may know, I love horses. I own two horses. I've ridden all my life. So I really liked Nightmare and Casper, <laughs> but I would probably have to say Superman um, because he's just so decent. And so I read a lot of, I would read a lot of the Superman comics. Um, and it wasn't until I became an adult and got involved with first George, the, the superhero game that George was writing for us, and then doing wild cards that I really started um, paying attention. And I admit I've come to it more through the visual medium than I did through comics. Um, because, you know, part of it, I, I had a very, very close friend, Lynn Ween, who created Swamp yeah. Thing and Wolverine and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I even said to Lynn, we used to, I used to go over to the house and we would watch uh, all the Flash and we would watch all the superhero shows together. And um, I had to say to him, it's like, I don't even know where to jump in, you know, because the Marvel written universe is so big in the DC. And, you know, Lynn edited for both of those huge, huge uh, companies. And, you know, it just seemed overwhelming. And, and the MCU was a way for me to be introduced to it and, um, and, and, and not be completely overwhelmed by, wait a minute, did they retcon what, what was in, you know, Infinite, Infinity Wars? I mean, what? You know, um, it was just hard to figure out how to get into it if, if you sort of hadn't been following it. Oh, so. yeah, certainly. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm a film girl, you know. Well, that's the thing we talk about a lot on the channel is like, is like you know, uh, gateways, jumping on points, how to get into comics, because, yeah, it's it's not the easiest thing. And, when, and especially, even if you're like a big comics reader like I am and you get out for a while like I have, I've read very little new in the last couple of years, now I'm in that place. It was just really overwhelming trying to get back in. Uh, and... And, and I and I stayed current for ten years, and that's hard. So I can only imagine what it's like for somebody that didn't grow up with it. Oh yeah, it was, and, and I I have read all of um, the the Darth Vader comics that have been done. Um, I just I just think they're brilliant. They're, I mean, you huge stack of them. You know, every one of them was so fantastic. I think that so. that first one is is, is great. Uh, and I, I, I wasn't sure about that second volume. I was it. I'm forget. Was it Kieran Gillen that started it? And then, yeah. Anyway, the, but that that, se that second volume, I I wasn't into. I mispronounced. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll mispronounce his name. Um. Uh. So. So. I, I just. No, I, it's no, it's Soul. Yeah. So I just think he's a terrific writer. Yeah, I think he is too. Um, yeah. So I, I, I love. I enjoyed all of them and. You know, I, I know he told the full story, but I was like, I would like to have some more, please. <laughs> you know, because I, I find Darth Vader fascinating. So Yeah, me too. Um, and I and I've tried that new volume that just started the first couple of issues of that, and it's it's pretty good too. Uh the the kind of uh, in in between um uh Empire and uh and, and Jedi stuff. Um it started I forget okay. who was writing that, but it's it's it started off pretty well. So yeah. Um, somebody earlier uh, mentioned that they, uh, you know, prefer the old EU, and I'm kind of in that place too. How do you feel about that as far as Star Wars goes? Um, yeah, I I was disappointed in the the three new, you know, the new generation. I mean, I like things that bring in fresh blood. I mean, we did that in Wild Cards, and I think it was made it stronger. But I, I felt like they lost what made Star Wars Star Wars. And, um, you know, the exception to that has been Mandalorian. But, of course, it's it's two gentlemen who really, I think, get Star Wars on, on a really fundamental 
level, you know, Filoni and, and Favreau. Um, and truthfully, I prefer the, the, um, the, the older, the older movies and Clone Wars and, and Rebels to, uh, to the, to the new characters. Um, and some of that, you know, it's certainly very appealing actors and characters that I think could have grown, but they just, the first one felt like they just remade the first Star Wars movie with younger, newer people, um, you know, with Finn and, and Ray. And, uh, and then I'm an outlier. I really liked um, The Last Jedi. I thought it was brave. I thought it took some fascinating, made some fascinated choices, took some big risks. And then I thought the third one just kind of was, it, it, I play video games too. And that movie felt like a fetch quest for me. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. like, well, first you go here and you have to get this thing. And then you go here and get this other thing that takes you to this other place. That get, you know, I mean, it, it just, it, 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 it felt like a fetch quest. And, and um, you know, for a moment, I thought they'd actually kill Chewie. And, and it's horrible. I mean, I, I actually got teary, you know, when I was at the theater opening day watching it. Because I always try to go see Star Wars movies on the opening day because I love them so much. And then it turned out not to be true. And so I was like, you know, no consequences. And, yeah. and that's, yeah. It wasn't yeah, a set that wouldn't even allow problems. anything like that to stick. It's like, why are you, why are you screwing with me? And within 10 minutes too. Yeah. It was like, you know, and then there was Rogue One, which was so powerful. I mean, at the end of that, I was just blown back in my seat in the theater and I was like, okay, this is a Star Wars movie made by Disney, and my God, they went there, they went there, they killed everyone, you know, and, and because it was a suicide mission, and they, I mean, it was so powerful, it was so moving. So, yeah, I love Rogue One. <laughs> I like Rogue One a lot also, yeah. Um, Solar Dragon and a couple other people mentioned that uh, they had never heard of Wild Cards, and I figured we'd see a little bit of that. So uh, would, would you give us just a real brief... Obviously not history of wild cards. It goes back a few decades, and there's a ton of it. But can yeah. you just kind of, kind of, kind of pitch it a little bit? Just let folks know like what that is. Maybe what the best jumping on point is. Is it all the way back at the beginning, or is it something more recent that's come out? I know we kind of did this when I interviewed you before, but for folks watching right now, they might like to know something about that series. Okay, Wild Cards is a shared world anthology, which means that George and I created the sandbox. We invited a lot of writers to come and play in the sandbox. The fun of it is that we get to use each other's characters. Uh, I'm writing a wild card story right now um, where my character is interacting with two characters created by other writers, Paul Cornell and Carrie Vaughn. So that's that. It is also a superhero universe where we try to take a really real world look at what would happen if there were superheroes. And it all started in 1946 when an alien virus was field tested on Earth that has dire consequences. Most people it kills, other people it twists into uh, horrible forms. They're called jokers. And then our superheroes are called aces. And we've been doing this for a lot of years with some wonderfully talented writers. I think the two best places to start, book one called Wild Cards is sort of the historical that begins in 1946 and then goes up to 1984, 85. And then after that, I would jump in on Inside Straight, which is our new generation with a whole new generation of writers, um, just terrifically talented people. Uh, Daniel Abraham, who's part of the French, the Expanse, uh, he and his partner are James S. A. Corey, um, and uh, Carrie Vaughn and Paul Cornell, who wrote for Doctor Who. I mean, we have some extraordinary writers in that. And then if you love it. Um, get in touch with me and I'll tell you, because not all of our books are perfect. I mean, you know, George and I've gotten a lot better at this as we've done it over the years. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of Wild Cards. And I did work very hard to get it set up in Hollywood. And then sadly, we didn't get to go to series. We did a lot, wrote some scripts and we did some great work in a wonderful writer's room. But unfortunately, um, Hulu was sold 100% to Disney. And I think that kind of, we would sold to Hulu. And okay. I think that kind of killed us because, yeah, Hulu that's, has Marvel. That's disappointing. Disney has Marvel. So, at the yeah, time, yeah. 
and and they've and they've been weird about like yeah what what darker stuff they'll let continue and where they're gonna put it and I mean the, the sense has been anything really rough and tumble Marvel might want to do would probably go to Hulu but they haven't done like a Daredevil or anything like that yet so uh, if they're not willing to go even even as far as Netflix Daredevil you ain't gonna get wild cards there S- no. sadly oh, no yeah. having read some wild cards. It's it's dark. Uh, it, it gets pretty brutal. And I've not I've I've only read the first book. It probably there are probably uh, stories and books that aren't that that aren't as dark. But like overall, that's a pretty rough and tumble universe. Yes, I mean you know we wanted to and and our newer books we we have with the younger generation we have a couple that are actually funny. I mean just flat out comedic. Um, and I'm very proud of that book that that um, we did called Texas Hold'em, which is a lighter, more, you know, it's just about a band competition, you know, in in, uh, in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, with Joker kids. Um, so we've had, you know, we've done a whole different feel, you know, some of them are, you know, young people learning that the world, that, that fake heroism versus real heroism. And, you know, we've done horror, we've done time travel. I mean, we sort of mix it up and play. Um, these things and I just finished editing a big book set in Great Britain called Three Kings. Uh, we have two books that explore what happened in the wildcard universe in Great Britain and not just in the United States. But we, we have tried to take a very real look at how culture and sports and art is affected by people having superpowers and, and politics in particular, which is something that a lot of superhero franchises don't really delve into and explore. And I think there's there's a lot of material there that could be delved into. I've always felt that's where Wild Cards does something unique, so. And that, that's often been one of my biggest criticisms of, uh, the, of, of the big two in comics, DC, DC and Marvel, where uh, they want the status quo of like politics and culture to look pretty much like what it does in the real world. And if you, if you had that many people with superpowers and you had the Earth getting wrecked by aliens every other weekend, it just wouldn't. The culture would be different. And that's one of the things I really like about what I've, what I've read of one cards. Yeah. And and the other thing that I'm hoping to do, and I, I used to be a lawyer um, before I got better and became a writer, um, but <laughs> I have really taken a hard look at how does you, how do you apply the law in a world in which there are superheroes? And they hinted at that in, in the in the Spider-Man uh, film, which yeah. was lovely. I mean, with you know, the folks who were stealing the alien tech and selling it and, you know, working in the cracks and, you know, the little guys, not the big famous Avengers, um, but they never go far enough. And so George and I are discussing possibly doing a wild card volume that's a legal volume. You know, how do wow, you defend cool. people? How do you incarcerate people? I mean, I've been having a lot of fun sort of trying to figure out what the legal system looks like in that world. <laughs> Melinda, if you ever get a chance, uh, you mentioned Charles Soule earlier with Vader. Uh, read Charles Soule's Daredevil one because he does a lot of that. Because of course, Daredevil's a lawyer, uh, and there's a whole thing about like the, the 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 law regarding unmasking and what what rights Daredevil or or other heroes would have, like keeping their mask on, and like he goes on the bench wearing his mask, and there's a whole fiasco about that. And I I, I think you'd enjoy that a lot. It's pretty believable well, as a as a lay person not knowing a lot about the law i'd be interested to see your your take on that and, and how well you think he nailed that but soul soul is also a lawyer and i think he might still be practicing although i'm not sure but i know when he started his career he oh. was okay. well now now i'm i follow him on twitter i'm even more curious now because you know this is something that fascinates me and uh and, I've met and him. i just nice don't think yeah, well, I hope someday, maybe when we can have comic conventions again, I'll get an opportunity to meet him. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the things. I'm desperate to write a Star Wars novel. And right now I know everything is kind of in limbo and in flux, but I'm mm-hmm. like, can I please write a Star Wars novel? <laughs> you know, I really want to. I know what the, what I want to write and I know what I want to do. That would, but, that would be uh, awesome. You know. I don't know how much you'd be willing to say, but what part of the Star Wars universe would you most want to write in? Would it be a Jedi kind of story, or would it be a, a, a more of oh, a... I, 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 uh, I fell in love Bounty with Hunters. this particular character, Rebels, um, Agent Callus, and I am fascinated with what makes people pick 
autocracy or fascism, you know, what's the trade-off and, and safety versus, I mean, all of these questions. And I'm also very interested in the things about, like Star Wars never shows us like the Minneapolis of the empire. Sure. I mean, it's always Coruscant or it's some desert planet where people are selling like, you know, fried toads <laughs> under tents. And it looks like, you know, it looks like the 12th century. And I'm like, is there no Amazon? I mean, you know, yeah. our mall, what does, and I want to do a story <laughs> where he goes undercover to break up a rebel, a rebel, uh, group and he actually succeeds you know but who who are these people and you know I know who I bring in and but I want to look at that world I want to look at what the economics look like is there a stock market I mean who's manipulating it I mean they're just there's so many things that I'm just eager to do um and I hope maybe someday I'll get to you think about the sheer amount of Star Wars that there is, and I've not obviously read anything like everything, and I'm a very casual Star Wars fan, uh, and only recently started looking at, at, at comics and things from the old EU. Um, I, I adore what I've read of Legacy. I don't know if you've ever looked at that, but it's it's wonderful, and you should, because it's like Batman Beyond in Star Wars, and it's fantastic. Uh, but um, there's of, of what I've looked at, I'm with you, there's not enough like like culture like just specific culture on some of those planets. Uh, Coruscant is lazy, man. It's like, oh, the, conveniently, the entire planet is a city, so we don't have to do anything interesting about like, like, like the, you know, you know, separate city states and different kinds of places. It's just all the same. It's one big planet. It's all the same. And the thing is, they're all like that. You got desert planet and you got ice planet, and like, it wouldn't be like that. Like, what is the Minneapolis? And do they have traveling theater groups that come through? And <laughs> oh my God, it's gonna come. I mean, I want this. And that's what I want to write about. And so I, I, I was also a singer. I studied opera in Vienna, and I've done a oh, wow. lot of, you know, musical theater. Um, and so, you know, I, I know what those things are like. And I thought, what a perfect way to carry messages without, you know, it's like the traveling, um, the traveling musical group, uh, theater group, coming through and dropping off messages, you know, and they're not suspected because they're they're just a bunch of hoofers, you know. <laughs> and, uh, like, what could you imagine like? so, no, an no. improv troupe in Star Wars? <laughs> That'd be fantastic. And they would, they might have some aliens in their cast. And how is that with the, you know, high human? thing that happens i mean there's so much there's so much juice i love i love it i mean i know we're talking so much about star wars and everybody's going but didn't you write for star trek and i'm like yeah because i grew up on trek but i guess if i had a choice i would rather be in the star wars universe it looks it's a little grubbier and it looks like it's more fun you know than um than, than star trek you know it's a little too antiseptic, the Star Trek universe, as it's developed. Yeah, and I never thought it had to be that way. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into that right now. But like, and of course, you know, I'm a, I'm a all serious Star Trek fan. Uh, so obviously, I've seen a lot more stuff than you have, and I don't have that exact same perspective on it. But during the TNG era, early on, it definitely was like that. Um, I, I, you know, you were talking about like, uh, like, like art and culture and stuff in Star Wars. Uh, that was one of the things I did really appreciate about Rebels. Uh, that you had the the girl with the Mandalorian suit that was like a graffiti artist. Like you hadn't really seen anything yeah. like that in Star Wars before. Yeah, yeah, explosive, um, explosive graffiti art. As a matter of fact. <laughs> um, so some folks asking a couple things about. Uh, uh, um, wild cards, we'll hit these real quick and then uh, DJ, I'll let you start throwing some questions at us. I know it's been like half an hour but we've jumped over to like a <laughs> zillion different things. Um, yeah. Jedi Knight, uh, Geefolution, if you could choose a streaming service to host wild cards, what would you choose? I mean, obviously they apparently attempted Hulu and it didn't end up working out. Um, I don't know if you have a chance at shopping that around again. I would say uh, Im immediately after what happened with Watchmen, the best place for it is HBO. Um, you know, HBO is a possibility. Uh, I also think, um, you know, Amazon, I think, is is doing really interesting things. I mean, Apple, Apple needs material. So, you know, it's just, but right now, everything is sort of on hiatus. So right. we're just kind of, you know, um, 
which one would I pick? I would love to pick a place where we become the big tentpole show for them. So, you know, maybe Apple just because it's like, hey, you know, we could we could anchor a big a big franchise for you. Um, but we're yeah. going to have to see, you know, what develops. And meanwhile, you know, we'll keep turning out the books and, and having fun with that. Well, and Amazon could potentially be a good place for it if they found interest because of the success they're, happen- they're having with the boys, although they might find that redundant. I don't know. Uh, have you watched any of that? Because some folks were asking about that earlier, and I still haven't watched it yet because I'm tired of cynical superhero stuff, to be perfectly honest with you, especially on television. Uh, and so I've still not looked at it, but people are writing me hard about not having seen it yet. So have you watched any of that? I watched the first season. Um... I don't want to get myself in trouble because I work in this business, <laughs> but sure. I have not watched the second season because I thought it was vile. I mean, that's the only word I can use for it. Um, and I, you know, I, I just, um, I felt like, I mean, I watch, I watch all the superhero stuff because I kind of need to know because of what, trying to get wild cards set up. And I, preferred the Umbrella Academy. Um, I, I, I didn't find any heart in, um, in the boys. I just found it to be shocking for the sake of shocking. And um, I thought, you know, life is so hard right now anyway for so many people. I don't need that in my space. So I have not watched the second season. Melinda, you, you just yeah. you just made some of my audience cry because I've got some folks that have been trying to get me to you know, DJ will, will test you for months and months to watch that show, and I keep telling folks I don't want to because I'm afraid it's going to be exactly what you just described, yeah, she and it's going to be so exactly much harder for me to sit down and watch it now because Melinda Snodgrass says it's too violent and shock for the sake of shock, which is just what I thought it was going to be, and that's what the comics were. It, anyway. I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, guys. I, I just, you know, no, I, I want, there's nothing wrong with a happy ending and there's nothing wrong with people struggling to overcome their own demons and doing the right thing. I mean, you know, I think it was Dashiell Hammett who said the best stories are about the human heart in conflict with itself. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think any of those people had hearts, you know, at least not that I could that I I wanted to be spending more time with, so you know I I gave up on it. <laughs> and I, again, I'm not saying I won't still look at it, but that hearing that hurts my feelings. I was hoping that that it, that it wasn't like that. And when I when I say oh well, Mel- Melinda Snodgrass says this is this is the editor of Wild Cards. Wild Cards was hard for me to read in places, and when I, like because that it pushes some envelopes. Pretty... Yeah. When, when I'm finding it <laughs> shocking and, and overwhelming, you know, eh. um, you know, I'm going to recommend a show that's now off the air. But if people want to see a great science fiction show that doesn't look like science fiction for the first six episodes, watch Person of Interest. It's a masterclass in writing for television. And uh, it's Jonah Nolan, who now does um, Westworld. And it's it's fantastic show with a brilliant cast so you know i've i've watched it all the way through i own it on disc and i rarely do that um and uh i've watched it three times all the way through and it's just it's a stunning tour de force of both writing and making television and plotting and structure and so you know if you're interested in great writing for television that's a show i can highly recommend I started it and never finished it, um, but I love Emerson, so I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to sit down and finish that at some point. Um, I'm glad to know uh, that, that you're saying it stays good because I don't know if that was one of those things that actually oh. had a decent ending or not, and that's pretty impressive. What you're describing on network these days, uh, and and not and not like an not like an HBO or a Showtime or a, or a streaming thing. So that's pretty cool. Jonah had the luxury i mean that's sad because he but he knew the show was going to end after you know four and a half seasons and he had 13 episodes and so they were able to craft and and i have this very strong feeling i'm actually i'm passionate about this that you have to stick the landing if you blow the ending i don't care how great the ride was i think it leaves people with a terrible taste in their mouth 
Um, and and my example of that is is I played this video game, three video games called Mass Effect. I don't know if anybody else is a Mass Effect game player. I put in 150 hours in that thing, and it had the worst ending I have ever experienced in a video game, and it just it ruined it for me. And I haven't even been able to go back and replay. And I like to replay. I've replayed Dragon Age Origins like four times, you know. But this game, I'm just like, oh, I love this world. I love these characters. Oh, I can't do it again because I know that ending is out there, <laughs> or that lack of an ending. And yeah, I this is something I, I feel very strongly about. You know, always know your ending before you start writing, whether it's a book or a TV series or whatever it is, movie. You've got to know where it ends, and you've got to be able to write to it. Yep. And if you let people down, um, they will not forgive you, whether it's a book or a movie or a television series. And you, got, and you guys have heard me say this for years and years, so now now we've got a professional on the channel also saying the same thing. I've always said you, you, write, you write toward an ending, and if your characters naturally take you to some other place, then that's fine, that's natural, but you can't have zero idea of where it's going. You also don't have to meticulously outline and have it all figured out, but always write toward an I don't like to start a project unless I have like a, like a flash of what the last scene might be. <coughs> I know exactly what the last scene is, but then I, uh, I was an outliner before I went to Hollywood, and in Hollywood we break stories. You know, we very carefully break a sure. break a script, and we always start. We put in the final scene of Act Five if we're doing the teaser in five acts or teaser in four acts, and then we. I usually go stick the teaser in, and then you put in the ends of Act One, Act Two, Act Three, Act Four, and then you plot backwards because if you know where the where you have to be, you know what has to take you there. And it's enormously helpful. So I, I teach this structure and, and plotting class a lot at universities and oh, cool. sometimes with friends, you know, so I'll be coming and do a guest lecture. <clears throat> um, I I would I would love to have you come in and, and, and talk to my group at some point. I may I may ask you about that at some point. Um, Baron OKC in the wildcard books, do you write out characters like Doctor Tachyon and Fortunato to make room for new ones, or do you just consider their stories finished? We consider their stories finished. Um, every character has an arc, and once that arc is is told, um, you know it's time for them to you know. It, it it loses freshness if you just keep grinding on a character after they've made their journey. And and so I think we've we've always been able to say, I mean, you know, with George's character, the turtle, um, one of the things in wild cards is people age and people die. And so, you know, Turtle is 72 years old now. He doesn't really want to fight crime anymore. <laughs> you know, he's tired and has as a lady friend. Um and so we wanted to have that sense of life going on and, you know, the young Turks coming in and muscling the old guys out of the way. And, and uh, we usually do have a story that once it's told, it's, it's told. I mean, I have one last Tachyon story, but it's more about his daughter than it is about, about him. Um, and maybe someday I'm going to get to write it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not conscious. It's more dictated by by art and and telling a good story. Have you and George had the conversation of like like whether you'll retire the series or if you want to like uh, you pass the reins on to someone else y years from now? <laughs> well, you know, we we do talk about it. George loves it dearly. And please, before everybody loses their minds, he is working on Winds of Winter, okay? I wasn't, I wasn't even going to bring it up. We've already gotten that comment a few People times. And I was yeah. like, <laughs> he is working on That is why I did all of the editing on Three Kings, <laughs> you know, hello, um, because George is working on Winds of Winter. Um, you know, I think... Thanks for doing George that. George just <laughs> yeah, loves the series. And, you know, he's an old comic. He grew up on comic books. He's a comic book guy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, right now we're still having fun. And I think if the time comes, I would like for us to end it elegantly, you know, and not just have it sort of peter out. Um, you know, we have this master agreement, <clears throat> which... Um, was based on the Thieves' World Master Agreement, and then I tweaked it. 
And George and I discussed various ways to make this work well. Um, and, you know, we we do have a, you know, George and I handle it. And if anything happened to either one of us, but, you know, we probably do need to think about some younger, who would like to take over if George or I get hit by an asteroid, you know? Um, and we haven't really had that conversation. So we probably should, because, you know, we're getting deep into this, so. Yeah, I didn't mean to be morbid. I was just curious. And nobody lives forever. And considering that you're constantly, you know, like, you keep it in real time, like, I, that would be a thing I'd be thinking about. It's like, well, we've already done this for X number of years, and we've let characters <laughs> yeah. get old and die. So when that, unfortunately, someday, years from now, hopefully happens to us, or do we want this to continue? So it's it's cool to know that you've considered that. Hawk Flame, uh, man, I got to get into wild cards. One of the things that frustrates me about most superhero comics is the illusion of change. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, and in in, in th that same thing in te in old television series too, where you know you have an adventure and everything ends up right where it was before. Um, we never do that in wild cards. Um, what happens has profound impacts either on the individual characters or on the the wider universe. Um, you know, if if a president gets assassinated, then there are consequences. Um, and so we, we try to keep it really grounded and, and uh, how, how things actually move in the real world and the outcomes. Um, I, I don't know if you can tell me this since the, it, it sounds like there's still you know a hope that maybe sometime down the long or down the line uh, it, it can actually go to some kind of a, of a series um, adaptation. But were you planning on like was the Wild Cards TV show going to be present day or were you setting it all the way back where it started? A uh, present day, oh, okay. I, you know, I just, um, yeah, I mean, it would have been fun if we could get it established. I think going back and maybe doing a little bit of a historical would have been enjoyable. And we have a character who's perfectly suited for that in a character created by the great Roger Zelazny, one of the, you know, the masters of science fiction, um, a character called the sleeper, Croyd Crinson, who has lived through, he was there at Wild Cards Day and the way his power has affected him, he's lived through to the present. So he would be a great character to sort of explore the sweep of Wild Cards history. Um, but I think you have to you have to start present day. I mean, for one thing, it's just the cost of going back and shooting something in the 1940s or 50s. Um, you know, it, it's television. It costs a lot of money, you know, uh, the clothing, the cars, the, the look of it. And so... Um, we, we needed to sort of get it established. And, and we had to create Joker Town. And it was also going to be a show that was going to have an enormous um, uh, makeup and prosthetics um, oh, cost. Naturally. Yeah. Because our Jokers are, you know, they, they may have twisting tendrils instead of hair or, you know, just all of these very strange things. Um, and you don't want to look so like Inhumans. <laughs> yeah, and we also didn't want to have it look like people wearing funny rubber masks, you know. So, you know, it was gonna, and and then you're you're looking at, I mean, I'm gonna go a little inside the, off into the weeds here about being a, a writer producer, which is sure. what I am. I was a producer on Wild Cards, but you know, we were looking at our our lead character, and we had talked to a makeup company, and it was like, okay, this actor is going to spend three hours every day in the chair getting the makeup on which means that we only have five hours to shoot so you know those are factors that you start to think about in terms of the budget um you know how much is more does that add to the to the cost of shooting when you have people who have to have long e efforts in in getting their makeup on so um you know all of these things come into it i i uh, i don't want to presume to tell you how uh, you guys should do your show if you ever get that show made but it seems to me like it wouldn't have been a bad notion to go anthology with it uh because like you could you could do a season in present day and then as you suggest like you could you know you could jump back in time and do a whole season in whatever era you wanted to like you could jump around if you wanted to do it that way we we talked about it um networks was not keen on that idea sure. um anthology shows tend not to do all that well um, and so they're always a little gun shy about them. So, well, 
And that explains yes. why we didn't get that for Star Trek uh, with Discovery, which is what that show should have been. Uh, I, I stand by that, and I will forever. Uh, but and I and I think that's kind of what Fuller wanted to do in the first place, from everything I've looked at. Like there was there was I think a pitch to make an anthology, if I if if I understand it right. But um, yeah, I mean when, that makes a lot of sense because when you look at a lot of the anthology shows we've had that have been really popular, it's been a season and then they've petered off. Like there's not an anthology show that I can think of that's had more than two successful seasons. Seasons. And even then, usually it's the second season was okay, and then it just gets bad or no one cares. So that's understandable. Television is about company. I mean, you, uh, I commit to shows because I fall in love with the characters, and I think a lot of viewers do that too. I mean, movies are a spectacle; they're they're a visceral moment. But television is you're inviting people into your living room in the old days once a week. Now maybe. <laughs> because you're binging, you know, a couple, three episodes at a time, but you're watching it because of the characters, the people, and they're who you want to spend time with. And I think the problem with an anthology show is however creative and interesting each individual episode might be, you don't have that connection. Um, I mean, for me, that's why I don't particularly enjoy them. Um, and I always end up, you know, wanting to watch something where, you know, I fall in love with the characters and, you know, I can't wait for the Mandalorian just a couple more weeks, you know, um, to see these characters come back because I'm, I'm, I'm invested in them now. Um, Lewis Cox, American Horror Story has gotten not so well. I did like season three after, but after that season, I didn't care. And yeah, I've heard that. Um, and that's true of, uh, of, of, all, all the other ones of those kinds of shows that, that that I've heard of, I've not watched a lot of that kind of thing to be honest with you. But I mean, I mean, in in theory, um, I like the idea of like like season miniseries that all have kind of the same initial premise. So 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 sort of like a Twilight Zone that takes ten hours to tell. I like that more than I like the the old school in, like like single episode anthology idea. Uh, but it just seems really hard to to, to to stick the landing on that every time. I mean that's I've I've said this a lot on the show, but that's what Heroes was originally supposed to be. Uh, and that that cast got too popular, so so they season by season kept the same cast around, and they kept telling the same story, but worse every time and originally it was supposed to be a new group of heroes every season oh really interesting. which in retrospect i wish they'd done because it got terrible yeah no i i watched the first season of heroes and then i eh, wandered away um and your brain thanks you for it i mean we now have i love this new model i mean financially it's not great for writers because you know when you're doing eight episodes or ten episodes but what it means is you can plot an entire you can have an an, ex, um, an adventure, plot it across eight or ten episodes and tie it up and have a beginning, a middle, and an end and a satisfying, and then you come up with what's the next thing that happens. And that's, I mean, we've gone much more to the British, the BBC model, and I think it makes for better television than sort of just grinding out the episode of the week. You know, what's the adventure of the week? Now every, you're building, you're, you're building toward a climax that, um, you know, takes these characters on a journey. I mean, I love this new, this new model of storytelling. And I don't know why it took us so long to finally adopt that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, and you know. It just took forever. Uh, well, we, it, the streamers, I think, really made the difference. Of um, I mean. I mean, I remember one one producer when I was a baby screenwriter, and I was agonizing over the changes that that um, people wanted to a script I'd just written, and um, and it was Ira Bear actually who was a real mentor to me, and I learned a great deal from Ira. But Ira said to me, Melinda, you've got to stop taking this so seriously. Remember, we're just the filler between the important part, which is selling toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I never forgot that, you know, but now with the streamers and people having subscriptions, we're not just the filler between selling toilet paper. Yeah, the whole model <laughs> is different. The way it makes its money is different. The, 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 like, like the, 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 it's not even broadcast like it was. So it's not, it's not there where, where you know, the network would love for uh, people to just spend an hour watching commercials, but nobody's going to do that. It's a completely different model. Right. Yeah. DJ, uh, let's after almost an hour finally go to the phones, as it were. Uh, let's let's uh, right. let's answer some questions, shall we? All right, we got one from uh, super chat from Day Ghost. He says, 
Not really oh, a question. No. But oh, no. Is wanted... Austin going to be snarky again? He's going to be snarky again, isn't he? No, no. Well, not about her. About oh, okay. Else, he <laughs> says, hey, hey, Melinda, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, or Star Trek expert, and Measure of a Man is the best thing I've seen in the franchise. You rock. Picard looks awful. Okay, so <laughs> ignore Austin. Uh, he's a friend of ours. He's been on the channel some. Austin has only seen the first, like, nine or ten episodes of TNG. And he likes to pretend like he's an expert, but he hasn't watched anywhere past that. And he's not even seen Measure of Man as far as I know. So he's just screwing with me like he always is. <laughs> well, I'll say thank you anyway to Austin. I appreciate that. <laughs> if you, when you do watch Measure of a Man, uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a fun group. So anybody who wants to come hang out, just, you know, ping me. So. Cool. Thanks for that. Oh, and you know what? Before we get to, to, to more questions, because uh, I meant to do this at the beginning, but we got on a, a bunch of different things. Um, that was, I mean, I know it's been an hour, Melinda, but I feel like that was really economical. I mean, we hit about like, you know, we got about 20 times more things done than in either the presidential or the vice presidential debate. So, um, Melinda, I, let me go ahead and open the floor to you now and ask you to plug some books. What are you working on right now? Okay, um, I am, uh, right now we're very busy getting my books back available, and uh, yeah, we have a couple are available right now. This is The High Ground, uh, no, excuse me, this is, this case is <laughs> Kill Me, sorry, pick up their own book, um, and it is a, sort of an urban fantasy, but it's about a young woman lawyer who works in a vampire law firm in Manhattan, because I was curious about what the world would actually look like, the economics and the politics and the culture of a world in which there were werewolves, vampires, and elves. Oh, my. Um, so this, this is one. It's called This Case is Going to Kill Me. And uh, you'll also get a whole lot of stuff about dressage horses, um, because I finally gave a character my passion, which is riding dressage. Um, so... And book two, which is called Box Office Poison, is set in Hollywood, should be out um, in a couple of months. The other major thing I have going is this series is called Imperials. Um, this is book one. Uh, and uh, book two, which is called In Evil Times, is going to be up and available this weekend. It's electronic, print on demand. And by the way, both of these covers are by the fabulous Elizabeth Leggett who is a Hugo Award winner and a, just a wonderful artist. Um, and the thing I've done with Imperials that I think is a little bit different, it's a space opera, <clears throat> but it's a space opera that takes a lot of time exploring economics and second class people who are second class citizens and how I think humans are gonna react if we go out into space and actually meet aliens. I think the first thing we will probably do is the holy hell out of them um, because we're kind of truculent and um, and and we do have this thing that you know basically the idea came to me because I thought what if we were the evil invading aliens <laughs> instead of the other way around um, so that's what I play with and what I've done that's a little different is basically you're gonna follow these two characters uh, my young hero Thracius and then this heir to the throne Mercedes and you meet them in book one when they're 18. And when I finish the series, all five books are written. At the end of book five, they are, pe they are in their 50s. So you will follow them through their entire lives and their adventures and what happens to the Solar League. So those are the two major things I have. I'm writing a fourth book in my Carolingian series, which is about the war between science and rationality and superstition and religion. And um, that's actually the series that my TV pilot is based on, uh, that I've written and that we're hoping to start shooting in the not too distant oh, future. Oh wow, I didn't realize that's what that was. Okay, I knew you were working on a pilot, but I didn't know I didn't know what what it was, yeah, what it was based it's on. Based on it's based on my Carolingian books, and um, it explores these issues of, you know, why is it in the 21st century that people are, you know, like believe nonsense and don't accept science, yeah. you know. Like, yeah. Oh, I need to go get my aura balanced or, oh, crystal <laughs> cancer. No, actually, they don't. Um, <laughs> you know, might want to go see a doctor. But um, Melinda, I feel like they do. I, f <laughs> I feel like they do. That means that means it happens, right? 
Yeah, that, 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 that obviously, and if it makes you feel better as you're marching toward the grave, you know, <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little cold, but um, I live in Santa Fe, which is kind of one of the centers of woo-woo in the Southwest. There's a whole lot of people who adjust your auras here and give you a psychic reading about what your horse is thinking. <laughs> That's really specific, and it sounds like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I was at one barn when they came in to announce that we were going, to, they were gonna have a psychic come and and, and for only $50, they would tell us what our horse was thinking. And I was like, I'll do it for 10. I can tell you what your horse is thinking. <laughs> when is food? What was that? <laughs> when is food? What was that? Yeah. Oh my God, she's going to ride me now. Ugh. Yeah, that's what your horse is thinking, so. Yeah, not all that unlike what your dog might be thinking, really, um, except for the riding part. Yeah, but the dog would probably Generally. go, they love me and they'll play with me. The horse is going, they're going to ride me now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, Melinda, where can people order your books at the moment? Uh, they're available on uh, numerous platforms. Um, you know, Amazon, iBooks, uh, basically, you know, any any platform where you get your, your books, um, they are available and, uh, and also print on demand. So... Um, that's where you will find them. And I believe you can also order them uh, directly from Bard's Tower. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Alexi Vandenberg's Bard's Tower, but that's, uh, that's where, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> you can't escape me. So. We did a whole publishing conversation with Alexi a couple weeks ago. So, so yeah, yes, everybody that was there for that show, that Alexi, and he'll be, he'll be back on the program that too. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. The amazing Alexi Vandenberg. Yeah. He's my he's my new publisher, and I'm just That's thrilled awesome. with uh, with how it is to work in this new paradigm because publishing is is changing in a really profound way. But I'm I'm sure Alexi went into it much more um, effectively than I can. So. Some, yeah. We ended up arguing a lot more about just whether or not people are reading books anymore. That was like an hour long conversation, which was uh, <laughs> fun, but it was somewhat unexpected. Anyway, uh, DJ, let's go back to questions, buddy. All right, the next one is from T Edge One. Uh, Measure of a Man has been reviewed by several people and almost all have loved it. How does that make you feel? And also, uh, as it deals with a court setting, and this he asked this way before you explained that you used to be a lawyer and that you know all this, so this is a little uh, off topic, but he says, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of research do you do when you write a script? Uh, how does it make me feel? Um, hey, I'm getting Star Trek Four flashbacks. How do yeah. you feel? <laughs> um, I feel humbled and I feel honored um, and very fortunate that uh, things worked out that I ended up with an amazing cast and a great director and and my vision was put on the screen in in the way I pictured it nothing happened to that script and that was that was a wonderful experience um, where I did I mean, I do quite a bit of research when I'm in an area that is new to me. I mean, the law, I, my specialty in law school was constitutional law. And actually, Measure of a Man is based off of an infamous Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott, where a runaway slave, a slave was brought into free territory, and he then said, I'm in a free territory now. I'm free. I'm a person. And the Supreme Court um held that he was not. He was, in fact, still property, and he was returned to his owner. And I thought that that kind of could be applied in a very interesting way to data and talk about these issues that, frankly, we're dealing with right now. I mean, we're finally starting to look at this country's original sin, um, which was slavery. And so, you know, it was just the opportunity to see to see parallels and and use them, which Star Trek did very effectively all through its history and all the shows. Um, the one place that I didn't know is I had a good friend at the time was a retired Navy officer, a naval officer, and he mentioned he asked me what I was working on. I was very excited. I told him about Measure and that I was writing this spec script and blah blah blah, and he was the one who said to me. Do you know that when a ship is at sea and we can't get a JAG officer, the captain always defends and the first officer always prosecutes? 
And immediately that set up a conflict between Picard and Riker. And I thought, this is what Star Trek needs. It needs that, that, that sense of tension. And thanks to Jerry Weber, um, that script became much more powerful and much more meaningful because it could pit Riker and Picard against each other and put Riker in a very tough place emotionally. And that's what you want to do. You want to torture your characters. <laughs> so... And that was one of the hardest TV shows in history to do that with uh, because of the, the, the original series Bible. It was in, in the future, we're so enlightened, we don't have interpersonal conflict anymore. And you're like, okay, that's a nice sentiment, but how do you make a TV show out of that? Yeah, then there, you don't have drama. I mean, you know, drama is about conflict. And that was one of the hardest things about working on that show. And so you had to have a thing like that. And, I mean, I get art out of, it, it, out of, out of adversity, and you've managed it with that script. But, I mean, those were in, in those days were real few and far between. And it's really hard to work under those kinds of um, uh, constraints, certainly. Uh, Melinda, it's really interesting that, that, you, that you said, and I think, I think you mentioned that when, when, uh, when we talked before, um, that that came from a, a, a real-world dynamic uh, in the military, because uh, I have read reviews of, I, I've read a lot of literature about, you know, Star Trek, the making of Star Trek, and I, I have a huge reference library, and I have read a lot of reviews, or at least a couple reviews, that have, uh, that, that, that have called that kind of like a, an unbelievable, unrealistic plot device just to create that tension. It's really funny that it came from a real world thing and there are people that thought that it was really contrived yeah no it was it was absolutely you know the recommendation from a retired naval officer and and he even showed me you know the regs in the in in i think i have the he gave me his 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 uh regulations book i i have it here in the library oh, cool. um so no and and uh you know things that happened i mean i invented the poker game because the original teaser I had written for that script, they couldn't shoot it. Um, it was in a swimming original, pool, right? It was going to use a swimming pool. I was going to have Data having read everything there was to read about how to swim. And then when he gets in the water, he sinks like a stone. Because according to Rick Stern and, and Akuda, he weighed like 400 pounds. And so, you know, he just sort of walks across the bottom of the pool and gets out and goes... Okay, that didn't work. Well, first of all, they didn't want to go on location. Trek had a really hard time going on location. And as my boss told me, um, Brent's makeup would have washed off. So we had to come up with something. I had to come up with something different. And um, we wanted, you know, I was looking for something where you can read all the books, but it doesn't match the actual experience. So hence the poker game. Yeah, which was uh, you know utilized constantly and became a, a big kind of through through that series. And I, I, every every time uh, every time you talk about that, I just imagine uh, the last episode of that show. The, the final scene is is Picard finally going going to the poker game, and I always just imagine it now in a swimming pool. It's like it's like I should have done this years ago, and he just gets in the pool with everybody. <laughs> uh, DJ, what else we got? All right, uh, we have a question kind of similar to that. Uh, Daniel Davis, Melinda, how difficult was it to work on a long franchise and series with rules and notes about its characters? Um, yeah, interesting. Well, <clears throat> the thing I, when I, when I teach, um, I always tell young screenwriter, or aspiring screenwriters, if you cannot stand to have your work touched, do not go to Hollywood, um, write novels because you are going to get vast numbers of notes and you have to find a technique for handling that. And the one that was provided to me by another producer I worked with um, is that once I've written my script, my version of it, the way I see it, you film it perfectly in your head and then you let it go, <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> because you know that the your boss, the, the showrunner is going to have an opinion. The director is going to have notes. The actors are going to have questions. The studio is going to weigh in and the network is going to weigh in. And standards and practices will probably weigh in as well. And so there will be this constant churn as things, you know, adjust and change. Um, and oftentimes, if you are one of the if you're not the showrunner on a show, your script will be taken over by the showrunner or an, another executive producer, and it will be rewritten by that person. Um, and so again, if you can't stand having it touched, 
do not go to Hollywood. It will it will crush your soul. But um, you find techniques. I mean, this, the trade off is that they give you huge wheelbarrow loads of money, and so as opposed to writing books, which don't give you huge wheelbarrow loads of money. Um, so it's a balancing act. But you kind of learn to you learn to accept it, and and you have to. I mean, that's the beauty of creating your own show. You get to say what those characters are like. You come in on a, a show that's already been going on, then you have to be able to match the voice and the attitudes of those characters as created. Uh, awesome. Real, real quick, before we get to some more uh, questions, um, Melinda, given that you wrote one of the great courtroom dramas of Star Trek, uh, I, I think I think the best of TNG, one one of two really good ones in that series. Uh, there's some there's a couple of really crappy courtroom dramas in TNG, uh, but Measure Man's great, of course, and then uh, Drumhead's also really good, uh, though it's not as much of a courtroom drama. Are you a fan of uh, Court Martial? Court Marshall, um, is that original? Yeah, the track? Yeah, the, yeah, the TOS episode. Oh, I I loved it. I thought it was great. That's one of my and, favorites. And I, and I, I was yeah, just wondering I if you liked that the, one. Yeah, and the old lawyer with his files of dead tree books. You know, I mean, it was just no. It was it was it was terrific. Um, yeah, I, you know, I still have a deep fondness for old Trek because there was there was conflict and there was and they were just three great characters: the mind, the heart. And and the spirit, the soul, you know, in Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, you know, they were they were just they were great. <laughs> Uh, I want to read a comment real quick from uh, my good buddy Dan's News, a uh, friend of the channel who uh, comes on and does stuff with us, and uh, he's he's been a big um, uh, advocate for us yeah. for years. He's great. Uh, he says, I've been lurking and listening for a bit and got to run, but excellent show tonight. Cap passed my eternal love and admiration to Melinda. Measure of a Man is in my top three uh, Trek episodes. He and I talk about TNG all the time, and he brings up the Measure of a Man every time we talk about TNG. Thank you. Thank you very much. DJ, let's keep things a trucking, shall we? All right. Uh, here's one from Busted Sim. Kind of a technical question. Not sure if it's been asked, uh, been busy today, but is there a special script writing program you use or just Word? Um, yes, I use Final Draft. Final Draft is the industry standard. Um, every agent, every studio, every network can handle, you know, will be able to read a Final Draft script, and that's what most of us are working in now. Um, it's expensive. But there are student versions of it. If uh, if any of you are, you know, you just have to give them your class schedule and that you're a student and you can buy it for less money. Um, I also use Scrivener for my novels, and Scrivener does have a screenwriting uh, program inside it. I've never used it because I, I'm using what the industry uses, which right now is, is Final Draft. Um, and it's really intuitive and it's very easy to learn and very easy to use. So if you're in, if you're interested in trying to pursue that and you want to start writing scripts um, and you can do it, I would recommend you invest in Final Draft. I, I had to use Final Draft back in college, but I've not touched it in probably 10, 12 years. Uh, if you uh, if you can't afford that and you just want to uh, you know practice, uh, writing scripts and, and, and do the correct formatting. I mean, obviously, if you if you want to actually turn in scripts, uh, follow Melinda's advice. But if you want something open source, Keltex is also a really good program, and that's that's what I uh, tend to use when I'm working on stuff. I don't know if you've used that before, Melinda, but um, that's kind of the thing that people use on the cheap, and it, it seems to be a pretty decent program. And Scrivener is very inexpensive as well. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure how their screenwriting program is, but... Boy, they're pros. I, I use it for my novels, um, and I'm using it on the short story right now. And it's it's a very inexpensive program. Cool. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that. So thanks for that, uh, DJ. Let's continue. All right. Uh, and Boston Sin drops another one real quick. Uh, super thanks, chat. Man. Also, are you as annoyed by the lack of good doc episodes for Pulaski and Crusher as I was once I started looking for episodes to inspire my niece? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Um, I, the women, I mean, Uhuru, who will always have my heart because she was a singer, and and my God, she was a such a representation. You know, the first time we had, you know, an African American woman in a command position on a starship. But 
in many ways, the women of Trek always ended up in very traditional roles, except for poor Tasha Yar, they didn't really know what to do with. Um, I mean, if you stop and think about it, we have two doctors, and I loved Pulaski, and I loved writing for her because she was, she she had some, some bite, you know, she wasn't just sweet. Um, but we had two doctors, we had Troy, who basically was, you know, the sort of mom, you know, tell me how you're feeling, let me help you with your emotions. And Uhuru, if you boiled it down, was a telephone operator in the old show. I mean, they were nurses, they were, and and so, you know, and again, I can't comment because I didn't watch Voyager that had a woman in command, but I thought it was frustrating that we, we ended up with women in, in what I perceived of as very traditional roles. Um, and, you know, I mean, the thing that was so great about Ripley uh, in, in the Aliens franchise is that it was originally written for a man. And then they just, they didn't change anything. They just kept, cast Sigourney Weaver. And, you know, my God, what a, what a, especially in Aliens, which is one of my favorites of all time. I mean, Ripley is just kick ass. Um, and, you know, yes, she's protecting a child. I mean, it's, you know, two single mothers trying to make it in a tough universe, you know, <laughs> and, and Ripley. But, you know, she never seemed like a traditional figure. And, and um, yeah, I, I wish they had done more. I wish we had given all of the women of Trek something more to do. Um, I, 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 you know, I love Marina. She's just, she's great. And uh, there were things I wanted to do with Troy that uh, I never, I never got to write. So. Yeah, and I always felt like there was plenty of potential in that character. It just wasn't capitalized on. But that's not. And 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 yes, you're right. Like by and large in Star Trek, uh, and I, I and I can speak to the rest of it. I it, it, a lot of female characters do tend to get shafted. I think in TNG, especially early on, that was a problem across the board. There were there were there were there were a lot of characters of both genders that didn't get anything like enough to do and had lots of potential. And there could have been really you know cool things that you did with them. Do you? Agree agree with me because this is an unpopular opinion. Uh, I think had Pulaski stuck around, uh, she had every potential to be a fan favorite character. People hated her in season two. I think you you leave Diana Mulder there for, for, for two or three more years and you let writers really do some stuff with her and she would have turned everybody around on that character. I, I absolutely agree. Diana is a wonderful actress. Um, and, and just, you know, and, and again, Pulaski wasn't just Pablo. I mean, she just wasn't homogenized. She was, uh, you know, I like the fact that, that she kind of gave data, data shit all the time, data shit all the time. And, and she would stand up to Picard. I mean, everybody else goes, oh my God, Picard, you know, you're so brilliant. The Picard maneuver, which we all decided was him tugging down his uniform was the Picard maneuver. Um. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just really disappointed that, but there was this push to, you know, get hot babes and instead of, you know, older women were not invisible, you know, we're really not. And we still have things to do and say and offer. Um, and, and I just, I found it disappointing that, uh, I mean, I was reading about what happened to the actress who played, which I, you know, again, because I didn't know this character until I watched Picard, Seven of Nine. I mean, a costume that literally she had to be sewn into. And I'm like, that sounds like old Hollywood to me. That yeah. sounds like the old Hollywood that we should have been walking away from. Um, you know, and, and when we saw her in Picard, thank God she wasn't in the cat suit and she actually looked like a person. <laughs> you know, it's a good move. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I don't want to go on a feminist rant, but, um, I'm, you know, that was a little bit of a feminist rant. So. Sure. No, that's all right. I mean, Seven of Nine <clears throat> ultimately ended up being a wonderfully written character, and Jerry Ryan is a fantastic actress. Uh, she's a completely different character in Picard. They turned her into the Punisher, which is unfortunate. But in uh, but in but in, in Voyager, the, yeah, the only the only problem was uh, was making her that sex symbol for no good reason. Uh, and yeah, if, if, and I always felt that way with Troy too. Is like just put her in a normal uniform and move on. Like if, if you know. <laughs> you know, if if for the sake of eye candy to get to get 
uh, guys there, you 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 or you want to cast like one token really attractive woman and then give her some cool dialogue. Like it's a compromise you can make, I guess. And 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 and, and that's personally, I don't think there's necessarily any problem with that. But like, let's still like treat her like everybody else and and and, and put her in a, in a normal uniform. Like Jerry Ryan looks just as great and just as sexy in a uniform. Or being a Borg, uh, you know, she shouldn't even. It's inappropriate to put her in a, in a uniform. So she could wear some other thing, but it shouldn't be that. Yeah, yeah, I never liked that either. I agree. Anyway, let, <laughs> let's continue, shall we? Yeah, we got a, a writing question from John Ty. Oh, great. Thanks, Can John. a wholesome story be boring because there is no significant amount of changes in the plot? And can a story that is cynical be looked at as complex because of the big changes it takes with the plot? Um, interesting question. Um, I don't think, I mean, when, when you say, could you read the first part again? I, I want to make course. sure. I, yeah. Can a wholesome story be boring because there's no significant amount of changes in the plot? It's not about the plot. I mean, you don't, you don't need to surprise people if you create a character that your readers or your viewers want to go on a journey with and you're rooting for them, you know, then I don't think um, a wholesome story is necessarily, you know, a bad thing because people have, people have their own inner demons, their insecurities, their maybe I can't do this. You know, I don't think you have to have darkness in order to make it dramatic. And I think that's actually a mistake that young writers make is they inevitably go dark first because they think that means drama. And and drama can be can be something very small and very personal. I mean, I go back to Hammett, the human heart in conflict with itself. You know, is it that you know, between a, a married couple or a, a mother and daughter. I mean, you can tell these stories that don't have to have Earth. I mean, that's one of my complaints about the Marvel Universe a little bit, and I love it, but I do not need New York City. And, and the escalation of threat is not necessary yep. because a personal, a personal experience that is emotionally... I mean, the story I'm writing right now is about a man with severe PTSD because, and, and a sense that he is a monster from an action that he took and not there's not a lot of action in this story but i am feeling it deeply and i'm hoping the readers will too when i'm done with it and it finally gets published um so no i don't think that's necessary you don't have to threaten new york city the earth and then when you got to the dark elves in uh in in thor the dark world it was, <laughs> and then the entire don't get me started on on the whole Melikith thing, man. D Dark World Night, and I, I said I said this like a month ago when I did my written review on that. Isn't it crazy that the biggest threat nobody ever thinks about this? The biggest threat we've had so far is in the most boring of their movies. Isn't that crazy? Like if you look at the end of Dark World versus uh, Infinity War and Endgame, like it's still Endgame has a smaller threat than than uh, than Dark World. Dark world. I know. Now I happen to I happen to like the Thor movies a lot, and part of that is because um, I love Loki. I love Loki. Well, he's the cool part I, of that movie. My two favorites are yeah. Captain America and Loki, which I know is weird, but you know I'm <laughs> strange. But um, but Thor is amazing. It's an amazing movie, and it's the it's this it's the thing I use when I'm teaching the difference between plot and theme because. Okay, may I may I use um, a, a, a curse word, a small curse word, on um, your show? I, I mean, don't... we don't usually do that, but yeah, sure, uh, you can do whatever you want to, okay. Melinda. It's fine. I, I, will, um, I will use stuff instead. <laughs> so, plot, plot is the stuff that happens, and <laughs> is why it matters. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that that's sort of my rule of thumb. Um, and I sometimes use a stronger word than stuff, but um, yeah, that's so. And Thor typifies that. The theme of it is so powerful, and the plot is less important than the theme. So yeah, sorry, I went on a writing nerd thing. 
No, that's oh, totally cool. No, I, that's great. I, I do DG. I'll tell you, I do that on a regular basis. I come at everything from a writer's <laughs> perspective, and so that's what I'm always doing. Um, so yeah, the, these guys, these guys are used to it. Um, but yeah, that, I mean that explains the, uh, why you seem to like Sp Spider-Man: Homecoming as much as you do, because it it figured that out as well, right? Like that that is that is not a giantly crazy, uh, you know, huge, um, I. I uh, you know, threat by the end of it. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's just a guy who got a raw deal and is trying to figure out a way to keep his family going. Like, uh, and weirdly, it's he, he, Keaton's. And of course, I love Keaton anyway. But like, uh, his his Vulture, I think, is my favorite villain in MCU right now. Which is nuts because he's like the most small time villain they've got. But uh, the, the the thematic crux of the uh, you know you know taking the Vulture idea where he's like a guy who's a scavenger. That's a stroke of genius. And we've not done that in comics with him. Right. DJ. Um, real quick question here. Mutali wants to know, has Melinda seen HBO's Watchmen? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, I, I watched Watchmen. Um, you know, it was extraordinary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm really kind of glad they, they didn't go on. Um, I think it was, mm -hmm. you know... They told the story, and I'm not sure where you would go from that. And, you know, what what a lens on modern American culture. I mean, it was just, uh, I, I thought it was terrific. And to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of Lindelof, um, but I thought he, I thought what he did with Watchmen was, was stunning. I don't know. Who's, whose side is that? What is, is it a cat? Is it a dog? What is it? My elder, it's my 19-year-old cat. Oh, I have oh, a 19-year-old no. cat? That's amazing. I know. He seems really old, and periodically he forgets where I am, and then he starts yelling, going, where are you? <laughs> I'm in here. <laughs> why? Well, why? Well, I I, I, to, I totally understand if you need to get going to take care of your almost two decade old cat, Melinda. Um, <laughs> I know. Watchmen is a uh, is a really polarizing thing. Uh, we've talked about it extensively here on the channel. Uh, DJ and I are both in the and, and Dan Torrey too. Where all three of us uh, did a panel on that. We were uh, very much in the uh, overall. This is brilliant. It kind of kind of camp. Uh, and wow, that is a big cat. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but yeah, so I, I didn't I didn't know if you'd seen that. Um, cool that uh, that we got to hear you talk about that. DJ, uh, let's continue, sir, because otherwise we're gonna go down a Watchmen rabbit hole, and we just don't yeah. have. To. How many more super chats do we have? We are caught up on super chats. I'm I'm asking uh, questions from the from the chat right now. Okay, guys, if you want to throw in any more, I'm gonna go kind of last call on super chats. So I don't know, like five or ten minutes, maybe we'll take a little bit more if that's okay with Melinda. Uh, and we'll take uh, we'll we'll take a couple more pre-written in the interim, and then in, if in about ten minutes we don't see any more, we'll go ahead and wrap things off. Go ahead, DJ. Cool. Uh, Blue Dragon 5. Melinda, did you ever see the Chaos on the Bridge documentary? And did you ever have any stories about Roddenberry's lawyer, Leonard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm actually in Chaos on the Bridge. She is. I was interviewed for that. Um, that's when I got to meet uh, Bill Shatner um, and do an interview with him. And uh, no, uh, Leonard was before my time. I came onto the show after he was already gone, and apparently that was a good thing that I never had to deal with him. Um, so yeah, it, now I have not only saw it, but I was uh, interviewed for it. Um, <clears throat> although interestingly, I, one of my statements that Bill really loved never made it into my section. I, I mentioned that it felt like I was living through King Lear, you know, <laughs> with, with um, um, Gene was sort of a Lear figure <laughs> during my time, um, during my year and a half, the season and a half that I was on the show. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, an interesting experience. Uh, I, you know, I'll quote my friend Rick Manning. Um, he said once that Star Trek puts the S and the T and PTSD, and I think that's why I can't really watch any of the shows anymore. <laughs> that's totally understandable. Uh, and um, from where I'm sitting, it's uh, as, as as much as it's uh, as, as it's sad. I don't think it's any good. It's fine that you watch Picard because you didn't actually see Star Trek. You just saw a thing that has Star Trek in the in the in the title. Um, did, what was uh, what was Shatner like in person for you? He was he was lovely. 
um, you know, he was the toughest interviewer I've ever had. Um, you know, you do a lot of interviews, you kind of get into a pattern, but he asked these incredibly incisive follow-up questions. And I said to him at one point, I said, I really wish you could do handle some of the presidential debates yeah. because you wouldn't let people off the hook. I mean, he would follow up and follow up and follow up. We also both love horses. So after I finished filming, um, he invited me to stay for lunch. And then he and I talked about our horses <laughs> for the entire time. Um, he's a very fine horseman and, and he loves horses. So, you know, my experience with him was that he was charming, very bright, um, and he was very kind. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've now managed to meet every one of the, I, I, I never got to meet DeForest Kelly um, or, um, oh God, I've just blanked, Scotty. <laughs> Doing. How embarrassing. James Doing. Doing. I never managed to meet them, but I've met every other um, original Trek actor. I had a me long meeting with Nimoy once. Um, and it's, you know, for the kid who grew up on Trek, it was a real thrill, you know. And, well, and, and I, got, I got to meet Nichelle at uh, Comic-Con a few years ago. And, you know, my God, she, Uhura singing and, ten, you know, uh, in the rec room while Spock would play the harp. Some of my favorite memories of Star Trek, the original series. Yeah. And uh, Walter Koenig is a fellow writer. Yes, I I was trying to work with him on a project that never oh, actually really? got off the ground. That's sad. Really enjoyed, yeah, I really enjoyed meeting Walter. He's he was just a fascinating and you know um, very passionate man um, about about issues of injustice. And I mean, it was it was great getting to know him. Yeah, uh, for folks that, and I, I've been plugging this a lot lately, but I really like it, um, Altman's uh, uh, podcast, and they, I hope they have you on that at some point, by the way, Melinda. I don't know if you've listened to it, but the Inglorious uh, Trespirts podcast um, from, uh, from from Altman, uh, he did one, a, I think, a year, year and a half ago with Walter Koenig, and uh, they talked primarily about uh, the book that he wrote during the making of motion picture called uh, Chekhov's Enterprise, and it's a, a fantastic interview. So uh, everybody go listen to that if you're in, into Star Trek at all. It's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. DJ. All right. Um, speaking of that, you keep giving me great segues. Uh, Blue Dragon 5 asks, Melinda, do you keep up with any of the other Trek writers? Um, I, I keep up with Rick Manning. Um, we, we sort of uh, tease each other back and forth on Twitter. <laughs> But that's pretty much it. Um, a lot of the other writers have, you know, either, um, you know, stopped writing and they're not involved in the business anymore. So really, it's only Ricky that that I I have close contact with. And and when I get to when I'm out in L.A., we periodically try to get together and you know have lunch or catch up on things. Do you ever talk to uh, Ira Beer? I don't, um, and and that's weird because I admire Ira so much, and I'm so grateful to him because I feel like he taught me a great deal about about how to break a story and screenwriting, and um, you know I, I do consider him to be one of my mentors. Um, DJ, let's do uh, let's do one or two more if we got like a real short one. All right, I'm gonna do one more from the Dragon Five uh, because he's asking great questions tonight. Uh, what's Thanks, more Ray. interesting? What's more interesting to you, an idealistic hero who refuses to change in a morally complicated world, or a good hero who's done something bad, trying to balance the scales? Oh, the, the good character has done something bad, trying to, <laughs> to balance the scales. Absolutely, um, you know the you know, that conflict thing. That that's uh, you know how do you expiate your sin? Um, that that's fascinating stuff. I and another one from go ahead <laughs> from Daniel Davis Melinda favorite movie or TV show of the last decade oh, gosh <laughs> I also yes. always hate that the question tough my favorite movie. Um, oh god favorite TV <laughs> show person of interest hands bar none hands down great show um, movie that is really tough past decade um 
probably Rogue One. Was it a, oh. on, was it in the past decade? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, there's so many things I've enjoyed, but that movie has stayed with me. And I think that, and, and if you want my favorite movie, it's going to be Casablanca. Which I finally back. watched for the first time, like, three or four months ago, and it's it, it's just brilliant. It's one of those that I always kind of avoided because it's just, like, talked about so much. I felt like I'd seen it, and then I watched it, and I was like, oh, yeah, I should have grown up with this, shouldn't I have? Okay. You should have grown <laughs> yeah. up with this. It, it's, um, it, it's just, it's extraordinary. <laughs> so, yeah, so there, there you go. <laughs> those are my... DJ, do you think um, do you see anything else that's earth shattering? Uh, no. Here's a. I, I'm just kind of interested in this one. Um, Blue Dragon Five wants to know if she is a fan of Seth MacFarlane's The Orville at all. Oh, I love The Orville. Yes. Oh, good. I love The Orville. Yeah, I mean sometimes the jokes are corny and they fall flat. The Orville is what Star Trek should have been. What Next Generation should have been. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I love it. I I'm like please. I can't wait. You give me more Orville. Um, I'm and glad you're they, watching that because that's that's like real Star Trek. It is. I mean, and they finally. Um, I hated the holodeck. I hated it. I wanted them to decide that it caused cancer, and they had to close them all down um, because I thought it made lazy, lazy writing. Yeah. Um, and I just hated it. And the Orville found a way to use the holodeck. In an interesting way, which was in the, that, that incredible episode where the young security officer deals with trauma, deals with her trauma by going through it. And and then, of course, you know, <laughs> the holodeck is for porn, OK? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, and they just address that and they don't mess around you know yeah, they it just worked and that should have seemed to had a lot of that show is it oh we could talk about the orville all day long oh. um it like like I'm it, glad it, i asked it. that felt yeah i'm glad you did too um they, very often and they don't always hit the mark but very often uh they'll, they'll do a thing where i'm like that's gonna be too heavy-handed and then that only stick the landing they go a totally different direction than what you would have expected and it's just Absolutely. wonderful that episode yeah. has the scariest clown in the history of scary clowns <laughs> It's yeah. freaking horrifying. It's it was like he yeah. was like it hold my beer. Like it's so much scarier. <laughs> no, I I like the show very very much. Um, I would I would love to have written for it. I mean, you know, it it's just it it's great. <laughs> oh, I wish they'd bring you in for a script. That that would be that would be great. Um, and you probably know a couple or, or or work with a couple people that are on that show. Oh, I'm, I'm not totally sure. Or maybe it's people that came in after you left. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I know I know you didn't work with Braga. No. And um, Echevarria, I, I, one of them, I can't remember which one I rewrote. I rewrote their script, Data's Daughter, the Data's Daughter script. Yeah. But I can't remember which, which of the two gentlemen it was. I it's it's been was a long Echevarria, time. but I'm not, I, I can't remember right off either. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that I did the rewrite. That's um, uh, the on offspring. The, the offspring, yeah. I still call it Data's daughter because that was our shorthand for it. We had shorthands for everything: Hot Fudge Troy, <laughs> you know, Data's daughter. Oh my god, I got so sick of Hot Fudge Troy. Like throughout that whole series, she just is so obsessed with. With I'm convinced she would rather eat ice cream than like have relations with a man. I'm convinced of that. <laughs> It got really silly. Anyway, uh, well, I don't know that that's the note we should end on. Oh, oh, real quick. Um, should end on. Yes. How, how did you? How did you? How did you feel about the the the, the big two parter they did in in the second season of the Orville? Oh, it was it was um, it was great. I mean, I, you know that character. I mean, I I have this. I, I'm fascinated with robots. I mean, I think people are. You know, yeah. and. Uh, and Isaac is an amazing character. I mean, I would have sworn it was Brent when I first heard the voice, yeah. you know, the first episode. Um, and and the whole, I mean, ah, the relationship with the doctor and, you know, and then the turn. I, yeah, I, I really, and, then, and my God, they spent money. Those effects when the fleet show up is pretty impressive, so. Um, I was going to say, that's the best space battle I've seen in a while. 
and and it was and, and like I'm not I'm not superficial like I'm not like a big space battle guy but even I was like wow that looks really good like 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 yeah. and what was really cool about that battle because you had this problem even even a lot in DS9 which had some some cool space battles everything led to something like it wasn't just a bunch of ships flying around shooting things like there were like actions and consequences like a thing would happen and then like it naturally led to that and no, nobody had to talk about it you could tell looking at the cg what was happening well and the mod because they do model work on that show which is awesome um yeah. but uh but yeah it's it's beautiful and i think it's braga's best script like looking at all of the rest of star trek i think it, i i think he, he wrote the first part i think I, I think it's the best thing he ever wrote um which is crazy but anyway um yeah i just wanted to hear you weigh in on that oh man now i wish we'd just done an orville show <laughs> <laughs> well there another time <laughs> another time we'll talk about the orville <laughs> yeah so. if you were willing i uh, it, I'll, I'll ask you about this later but it would be really cool to uh, have you come in after the third season and just and, and, and just have you on the panel for the for the spoiler cast that'd be really neat yeah, I need to. Uh, when are they? When are they going to air the third we season? Don't know yet. I don't even know if they're I, done filming it. I don't think they are. Well, everything is so. I mean, right now with COVID, if you if a show is going to cost four million to shoot, it's now going to cost eight million to shoot, and that's one of the problems that you know is just everything is tough, you know. And kimchi is weighing in on <laughs> on how to shoot right. Now. No, no, she's right there in that room. She hasn't gotten up and left. Like, you know, she's right there. It's it's okay. Uh, so Alexi is screaming at us in the comments, so we have to do this really quick before we go. Uh, I, Volund, I apologize. He, 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 he wants you to weigh in on Babylon, on Babylon 5. I can't. I've never watched it. You've never watched any Bab 5? Nope. I, I was going to ask George you. And I George and I watched, tried to watch the pilot together, and I can't get past the pilot. I'm told that if there's some way, I'm told if I can, like, start second season that I will love it, but I, I can't get past the, uh, yeah. I've I never been that, past Melinda, I had that for 15 years. I mean, I tried three or four times and I couldn't do it. And I finally forced myself to, to get through it because one of my best friends is really into that show. And we were doing a series uh, talking about it, which we uh, never ended up finishing um, because it was just taking too long. But I've now watched through season four and it's it's some of the best science fiction on television, bar none, uh, that, that, I, that I've seen anyway. It's better than Deep Space Nine and I and I adore the S9. Um, but yeah, the CG is real hard to look at. Uh, it's just, it's not the same. It's just it's just the first season. I mean, it just that first pilot. I mean, that actor they had as the commander, and I mean, oh, yeah. I I just I have not been able to, you know, and and that's um, so fair. I have limited time in my life, you know, between the horses, the writing, some video games I want to play, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's just oh, well, you don't have to explain yourself to me, Alexi. Bring it up. I assumed that you'd seen it then. I assumed maybe you and he had talked about it. Nope, never seen it. <laughs> never seen it. Um, I, you know, and I know I get I get yelled at all the time. But um, you know, there's also just so much great television that I want to watch. I mean, you know, I I I really enjoyed. Why am I blanking on the title? It has this um, the uh, the limited series with Legolas in it about you know, immigrants, immigrant elves. Um, oh God, why have I blanked on the name of that show? Um, I know what you're talking about. I'm not about. sure what that is either. Yeah. Somebody help us out there. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> say. Yeah. Cause I blanked on the, it had an odd, it had an odd title, but, um, and in fact, I have a screener. It's sitting right in the other room, but. Carnival uh, Row, is that what it's called? Carnival Row. Yes. Oh, thank you. Carnival Row. Yeah. There's a fantasy show for you. I need to finish that. We, my, my wife and I started the first episode, but we never got back to it for some reason. Uh, I liked it. It's better. It really builds, and it okay. really goes to very interesting places. So, okay. yeah, I quite enjoyed it. So, And I guess on that note, I should probably go make some dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks for sticking around and hanging out with us for so long, um, Melinda. Really, really 
as always, so much fun. Thank really you guys appreciate your time. Me. Yeah, of course. I've, I've, I've wanted to have you on the show forever, so it was really neat of you to do it. And uh, thanks to Alexi for putting this together for us. Uh, everybody check out Melinda's books. Uh, they are at uh, everywhere bookstores are sold. Um, if you have uh, forgotten the names of everything we talked about, uh, Melinda does have a website. And if you just uh, look up Melinda Snodgrass, you'll find that. And uh, in the meantime, thanks so much for watching. As always, everybody, uh, you guys are great. And uh, come check us out uh, Tuesday night, DJ and I are going to uh, watch Thor Ragnarok and do the uh, Marvel Mania on that. So uh, look forward to that. And in the meantime, I was Captain Logan. This was DJ Martinez. Hi, guys. And special guest host, Melinda Snodgrass. Thanks, guys. Good night. Later, folks. <laughs>